Good afternoon. We'll start on time. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Abhishek Sinha. I'm the principal product manager responsible for a couple of products in the big data space, Amazon EMR and Amazon Athena, to be specific. And uh, I have an immense opportunity here to welcome two customers who are going to talk about um, a use case, who are going to talk about how they have built a data platform on top of AWS using EMR. So these two uh, companies are very diverse in their cultures. They come from very different businesses. But the reason we kind of brought them together was they have one common theme that kind of binds them together. And they will talk about how they've built uh, these platforms. The common theme is they're all going from a team that does data analytics for their businesses to a team that is building a data platform for all their lines of businesses. So I'm uh, delighted to welcome uh, Salesforce.com and Vanguard, uh, both of our premier customers, um, uh, onto the stage. Let's start with uh, Salesforce.com. That's uh, Rupak and Siddharth from Salesforce. Welcome. Thank you, Abhishek. So, uh, so my name is Rupak Gupta, and uh, I, I became part of Salesforce through the acquisition of Crux. It happened a couple of years ago. And uh, I think we started around in 2010. And the interesting thing is, you know, we have grown with Amazon. You know, at that time, AWS was also, I mean, the reInvent conferences were not this big. You could go into one casino, and that, that was it. Uh, but uh, in the last, you know, we have grown with Amazon. We have learned with Amazon. We have pushed. We have pushed Abhishek and the team and all. And so uh, that is something. Uh, but what we are excited about is we have built our entire technology now, now in Amazon. And I am very excited to share some of these. So with me, we have Sid. I'm Siddharth Sharma. And I lead, lead a team which manages the handshake between Amazon Web Services and Salesforce DMP platform. Cool. So uh, I'll start with a forward-looking statement, uh, which is uh, you know, just to make sure our legal team is happy. Whatever you, whatever you buy, or whatever you, whether the stock or the product, just make sure it's based on what we have. So uh, before we start on the technology, I just wanted to give a quick, you know, what is a DMP? What does DMP really mean? So think of DMP, uh, we are part of Marketing Cloud. So it's a, it's a critical piece of the marketing you know, tech stack. And what we do is we collect data from all the different sources that brands or publishers have. So whether it's your browsers, whether it's your app, whether it's uh, you know, CRM system, whether it's offline files, all that, we collect the data. And this is both your known as well as your unknown users. Then we apply, we unify that data, we, apply and we clean the data, and we apply an identity layer on top of it. And finally, we allow our customers to create segments. Now, these are the segments that our customers are interested in. They can be used for targeting. They can be used for giving different experience to their clients. And every market in the world is trying to do that. They're trying to find the right audience. Now, if you look at our DMP, it is, it, it is at internet scale. If you look at, this is like a 60-second you know, view of how much data that we collect. And just as a comparison, if you think about it, uh, Twitter does about 350,000 know, tweets per minute. And we have about 200,000 QPS. So we collect data from all over the world. And we have grown. You know, when we were a startup, we were very small. We had a few clients, but we have grown with Amazon to be at this scale. Uh, this is just uh, you know, some of the brands that are, that are part of our, you know, our uh, you know, client base. And we have more than 40, 40 petabytes of data that we process, that we analyze, that we filter on a regular basis. Uh, this is the, so now we'll get into a little bit of tech. Uh, so, uh, so I would love to show you the kind of architecture that we have built. This is an overall architecture of how, of how we have built the DMP. And then we will get deeper into one aspect of it. So in terms of data collection, you know, as we, you know, uh, as I said, you can get it from your pages, from your browsers, from your apps, from CRM system. All the data gets collected. We process it, and we keep it all in, um, uh, all in S3. There is also what we do is all this data that comes in, it goes through a real-time pipe, uh, real pipeline. We use Kafka for that. And what we do is we use Spark streaming to take this real-time stream. We clean it. We assign meaning to it. We do segmentation on that. And then in real-time, we can send this data to our partners. Then you don't have to 
Uh, if you look at the center part of it, there, there we have, we support a lot of data science and batch workloads. So uh, a very common problem in, uh, in online media is, let's say uh, for a brand, you have a set of converters. And you have that segment, you know, these are the users you have converted. Now, what brands are looking for is, can you find me users that are similar to that? So how do you do that? So we have, we have built a machine learning uh, model around lookalikes. So all those workloads, we use EMR for that too. We use Spark as well as MapReduce to process the data. We look at the raw data sets and we figure out who are the users who have similar characteristics and we produce lookalikes for them. And finally, if you think about on-demand segmentation, our users are going in, all the data that is being collected, they are building segments with it. They are building rule-based segments. They're also, they are relying on our machine learning techniques to come up with Einstein segmentation. So that's what is being used to understand who their audiences are. And finally, uh, after this processing, we allow all these insights to be available to our customers. We allow all this data to be back on the page or back on the app so that they can do targeting for those users. And then we also use, uh, you know, uh, we have external APIs, we are connected with hundreds of partners where all this data can be sent so that the, our customers can find these users elsewhere. Now, I will go a little bit deep into the on-demand segmentation and to, to evoke the, the standard use case, if you see on the, on your, uh, on the left side, this is, a, this is the Salesforce Tower, uh, a picture of it which is not personalized. Anyone goes in, they see the picture of the Salesforce Tower. Salesforce DMP allows you to take that information and the user information, and it gives you a pers personalized experience. So on the right side, you will see it's a very personalized experience for you. This is what brands want to do. They want to know what are my users interested in, what are they looking for, and then they give you an experience that converts you into customers. Uh, and along with that, what we do is we give you a lot of information. We, we allow you to create rule-based segments. We allow you to create Einstein segmentation. And a combination of that along with data is what is used to help our customers. Going a little bit uh, deeper into it, uh, all the data that is collected, it goes into S3. All the rules, we have the DMP console where you go in, you create your rules, it all goes into RDS. And then we use EMR to connect the data and the rules that have been created. Now, uh, an interesting story is when we were really small, we actually started with Hive because that seemed to be the most obvious way to do it, which is, you know, we have this data, we, we, this was all unstructured data. We took this data and we, we, we converted it into a semi-structured data and then we wrote Hive queries on that. The interesting thing was to scale that was really hard because our clients started, you know, building thousands and thousands of segments. And you can't really run the Hive queries on the thousand segments because you are doing multiple passes of the same data. And for us, data, you want minimum passes on the data because the data size are really, really large. So we actually converted to use MapReduce and Spark to look at the data, look at the rules, and then make sure we do one pass of the data and the rules and then assign users to these different rules and different segments. And on top of that, what we do is we build Einstein segmentation on that because we do, uh, we look at your data and we figure out what are the patterns in the data. All that information comes in into the DMP and we, we create segments using that. Once you've created segments, we'll give you insights into it. We'll give you demographic information, we'll give you more details about the segments, but the most important thing that we do is we convert it to a user level segmentation. What that means is the segments that I belong to is very different than the segment that Sid will belong to or the segment that Ritesh will belong to. And it is giving, once you have these segments, it gives a very personalized experience for the end user. So uh, this is, we are, uh, think of our scale, you know, we are, we allow our customers to create clusters just by going in the console and creating segments. So our scale is really large. We have about, you know, uh, 3,000 EMR clusters running, you know, you know, it's a mix of MapReduce and Spark. And we use Spot instances a lot. I, th I think that has been a big savior for us. You know, being a startup at one time, uh, we were, uh, you know, cost was very, very important to us. And as our clients were using more and more of our product, and as we got clients all across the world, uh, Spot instances is something that came to our, you know, it saved us. And we have, we have been using spot, spot instances since. If you guys haven't used Spot instances, I would highly recommend it. You do have to architect your system 
in such a way that these spot instances can be taken away. So you need to make sure you can have retries, there are checkpoints, and all that is available for you. The other thing about spot instances is uh, earlier we used to use instance groups. But there, the challenge was you have to find the right AZ, you have to find the right place to get the minimum price for the right instance type and all that. So it was a little bit cumbersome. So we are actually very excited to use the instance fleets that we are using now where we give AWS a set of options that we want. And AWS helps us in finding the right mix of these options to be used to create a cluster. And uh, to find uh, I think Spot Advisor is also another very uh, useful tool that we have, which allows us to understand what is the probability of some of these instances either going away or you know, they will be taken away, and what, which has low probability, so that you can build your clusters or you can build the instance fleet in the right way. So with that, I'll pass it on to Sid to talk about the event-driven you know, the architecture that we have. Thank you, for sharing what we do, how we do, and the scale at which we run our workloads. I will now walk you through a simple example of how we effectively use instance fleet using event-driven serverless architecture. Our jobs are triggered either on-demand or periodically using Amazon CloudWatch cron rules. Both these triggers put a message to a SQS queue. SQS queue tries to decouple the producer from the consumer. This SQS queue is, is, is subscribed by a, by a Lambda function. Lambda function encapsulates the business logic of first passing on a job name and, and fetching the job definition from the metadata repository. As part of the job definition metadata, a developers must have defined the minimum processing, uh, you know, the, a minimum processing requirement for a job. Looking at the processing requirement, it gets back an instance fleet mapping from DynamoDB table. It then it then uses this instance fleet mapping, looks at other metadata like EBS volumes, and then creates a map-reduce cluster. This cluster uses H3 as the input and output data source. If for some reason a cluster fails, we have a CloudWatch alarm, which will send out a message to an SNS topic. SNS topic here acts as a pub sub to broadcast failure events to multiple subscribers. One of the subscribers is an SES email, which is sent out to devs. Another, another important subscriber is a, a failure retry handle, which is backed by a Lambda function again, which will retry the job. As, as, as part of the PubSub mechanism, you can add more subscribers, you can, you know, you can look at the failure events, uh, build out a payload, and, and send out an actionable alert to your uh, instant messaging tool. And then we also have a service which constantly looks at all the spot advisor tips and updates the, ins and updates the instance fleet mapping in a DynamoDB table. With this, let me share some learnings from experience running big data processing at scale. The most important requirement to use spot instances or to run ephemeral EMR clusters is to separate out compute and storage. If you separate out compute from storage, multiple clusters can access their S3 data at the same time. With this, you can also spin up and tear down EMR clusters without moving your data set. Uh, this gives birth to a pattern called as a job scope stateless workloads. The second important requirement is to not be dependent on a particular EC2 instance type. A developer should test, benchmark, and define the processing requirements in a generic terms, and then the, uh, and then the framework should take care of building the instance fleet mapping. This is something controversial, but from Hadoop point of view, what we have observed in our testing lab is uh, doing more with less helps in, helps in reducing the network chattiness and the interruption likelihood. Masternode is just the orchestrator and performs no computation of its own. Hence, you can run Masternode on cheap on-demand instance types to a save on cost. 
If your job needs more storage for intermediate processing, it is advisable to use a cheaper GP2 EBS volumes over expensive instance types, which comes with more instance stores. Last but not least, in order to effectively use spot instances, it is important that the, that the, that the system is built a ground up, keeping fault tolerance in mind. Your jobs have to be item potent, they should have checkpoints, and they should be self-healing. Moving on to storage learnings, <clears throat> uh, you should use S3 as your data lake. Right? With S3, you get infinite elasticity. Uh, you don't have to do any upfront capacity planning, and you only pay for what you use. And if you use S3 as your data lake, you should ensure that you store data in different log formats. Uh, formats like Avro and Parquet help you take, take advantage of data locality. For a reduced storage and faster access to data, you should also compress data in S3 buckets. El, you know, uh, there, are, there, are, there are few splitable algorithms like Elzo Snappy, which go well with Hadoop, and they help you run your jobs faster. For better audit, security, and compliance, we store data in buckets across multiple accounts. And using IAM assume roles, data from different buckets living in different accounts can be accessed in the same job. For massive cost savings, you should look at applying expiration and a transition policies to your S3 buckets. Uh, we have noticed around 20% reductions in cost after we started applying these policies. Here are a few optimization tips which are, which are specific to EMRFS, which is the S3 implementation of HDFS. Imp uh, optimization tips like uh, reducing the, uh, you know, which is like, uh, which is like reducing the replication factor, increasing the disk utilization, increasing the file max split size will help you will help you squeeze out more juice out of your cluster. Moving on to monitoring and alerting, we use tags heavily on all our Amazon resources, right? So we have a fixed set of taxonomy that we use on each resource that we use in Amazon Web Service. This helps you to associate and identify a cost failures for a team, feature, or a given cluster. At this high scale, a few bad jobs or few rogue Athena queries can cause a spike in your bills, right? So to mitigate, we have set CloudWatch alarms, which look at the a threshold for a given service and if there, there is a sudden spike in it, we, we, get notified, you know, we get notified immediately. That way you can keep a control on your cost. It is very important to observe a filter and notify failures, but the, but the most important thing is to build actionable alerts, right? So you need alerts which, on which you, which, which you can act immediately, right? Uh, sending alerts via email is an old school way of doing it, right? You should send alerts via your instant messaging tool wherein you can act immediately, right? So, uh, so we have integrated our, not uh, our, our failure notification with an instant tool wherein as soon as a cluster fails and uh, an alert gets sent to the right team and that person can immediately retry that job from the you know, tool itself. This is something that Amazon Web Service does not provide natively. And in order to help our support team with job investigation and deep, and you know, the, so what we did was we uh, we have built our own custom solution of ingesting all all the MapReduce uh, cluster jobs, you know, from one S3 bucket into an another S3 bucket. The the way we do it is we have S3 event notifications on the source bucket. So as soon as a log gets copied to the source bucket and S3 event notification gets fired, there is a Lambda function which is which is which is looking at that S3 event notification. <laughs> It looks at that event. There are some a regex file pattern in a wherein we a drop files which we don't need, and we then ingest it to our log aggregation tool. Uh, you can use your own uh, custom log aggregation tool, you know, based on Elk Stack, or you can use any third-party aggregation tool. Yeah. 
Uh, with that, I uh, thank you for listening to our talk. And I would now like to call you know, Aritesh Shah on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, let's start with an introduction. Uh, Ritesh Shah, I am a program manager within. Are we good? Okay, we are good. Okay, I'm Ritesh Shah, uh, senior program manager uh, for Chief Technology Office at Vanguard. Uh, I run a team that engineers all these services, uh, specifically in the analytics, AI, machine learning space, uh, for everybody at Vanguard to use so that everybody does not have to go through the same gyration over and over again. So my team is like an engineering team cutting across all IT and business units. Uh, before we go further, two questions. How many of you know Vanguard or have dealt with Vanguard? Quick show of hands. Looks like 50%. Uh, second question, how many of you have started your analytics in AWS journey or are new and about to start, or how many of you are already there to some level? Uh, looks like 40% are new, looks like. Those who raised hands were new, I'm guessing and remaining maybe already there. So let's start. Uh, let's start with first Vanguard, right? Background of Vanguard. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, investment management companies uh, in US, headquartered in Malvern, Philadelphia, uh, started operations in 1975, and we have multiple lines of business. Uh, we do institutional business, retail, uh, advisory business, international, and others. Agenda for today. Uh, we want to start with what I call state of the union uh, from a perspective of Vanguard, right? Why, where were we in 2017? Where are we in 2018? Uh, is why I, why I call it state of the union. Uh, what did we learn over those two years? Uh, some metrics uh, for 2017, 2018, uh, and those metrics lead to why are we changing some of our directions uh, as a reason of change. And then what are we looking at 2018, 2019? When I say 2018, it's like last month of 2018 going into 2019. So that's the high level agenda that I'm gonna walk everybody through. Uh, state of Union, uh, I like to present this in a way where we can start at 50,000 feet level and start driving deeper into how data lake and data platforms work within Vanguard. So first, a very high level of data lake. Uh, like you can see, typically most companies bring data from on their on-prem systems or third-party vendors that they work with into AWS. And we started with our data lake being in S3. So S3 is our data lake, all the data comes there. Uh, but what we do is we bring data and organize it in S3 based on data domains uh, that own that data. So that ongoing maintenance of that data is easier. And then we have business teams that take that data and derive it for their analytics purposes, uh, transform it into however format they want, and at the end, they then have their EMR clusters pointing to this lake and do their analytics, right? So at a very high level, that's the theme. The EMR clusters uh, used to bring data, transform the data, or for running analytics, we run all of them as ephemeral clusters. So they come up, do their work, and they go away, right? So they typically don't run 24 by seven. They run for a finite period of time that is configured by the cluster owners uh, and IT teams. 
So now let's go a little bit deeper, right? Uh, and this set of slides focus on internals of the data lake, right? So once we bring data into data lake S3, what we do is we put it into a layer, what we call is a raw layer. Data is typically brought in as is from the source system, typically never changed. It sits there in the raw format. Then we have set of clusters that spin up, clean the data, put it in a cleaned data area. Maybe it's a temporary area for some time, uh, but there are clusters that clean the data, and then either the same set of clusters or new set of clusters take data from the clean bucket and put it into a set of buckets we call ready for analytics. Uh, this, this is where most teams would be running their analytics from, uh, from their EMR clusters or any other future services. We have also seen data scientists who don't want to go to that ready for analytics data but go to the raw data. We do allow data scientists to go there, but typically most of the folks are using the ready for analytics data at times. Uh, now we dive deeper further into how do we bring data into the lake, right? Into different, uh, different areas or S3 buckets that I presented. So the first, first thing what it shows is all the code is deployed through an automated bamboo build process into AWS in an S3 bucket it has all the cloud formation templates, JSON, YAML, Ansible configurations, all of that is placed in a specific region in a specific deployment bucket. And then we have Control M uh, calling a load balancer and we have a job node that we utilize to spin up either an EC2 instance or uh, any other artifact that we need to spin up. Uh, moving on from there, this process shows if there's a vendor file, we want to bring that into AWS. We use this EC2 node, pull, have the DTS team that manages vendor feeds, push the data into AWS, into S3 buckets uh, that we have. One key important point, for Vanguard, all S3 buckets are encrypted, and all data in transit is encrypted. And when we encrypt data in, in S3, we use our own managed keys. Uh, AWS calls it as KMS CMK. So Vanguard manages their own keys, et cetera, uh, for the bucket. The another pattern to bring in data is uh, we may have data sitting on on-prem servers uh, in form of files and we FTP it. Uh, the way that process works is Control M spins up an ephemeral EC2 instance and then that EC2 instance pulls data from the on-prem servers and puts it onto S3 buckets. Uh, the next pattern is typical data stores, right? You have a lot of uh, relational databases out there uh, we spin up an ephemeral EMR cluster, use Scoop to bring data in from these databases, and store the data in S3, and we build a Hive uh, meta store or Hive tables on top of the data that is brought in. Also, we use uh, data replication tools like Attunity, and in future, we are looking at DMS as an way to augment, and we replicate that data into a RDS Postgres database, and from there, EMR clusters, um, sorry, I clicked quickly, uh, EMR clusters pull that data from Postgres, scoop it out, and then put it back into S3. So this gives like a high, broad overview of how data pipelines and transformations work at Vanguard. Next set of slides uh, are gonna be towards how do we do analytics at Vanguard? Once the data is in the S3 bucket, wherever we need it, 
how do we do it? Uh, the first section is anybody who needs a cluster for doing any analytics, their code, their cluster is deployed through an automated process uh, into an S3 bucket, all their cloud formation, et cetera. Next, we use, similarly, we use Control-M to spin up the cluster. Uh, because we, go, we have an ephemeral nature of all our clusters, we have Control-M spinning it up. And then once it spins up, it connects to appropriate S3 buckets. Uh, we have a centralized Hive Metastore to provide all the metadata about tables and data out there. Uh, is how we set it up for doing any analytics right off the cluster. We also enable Hue as a browser-based interface with a Hive Presto as capabilities to perform analytics. Next, we also support at Vanguard, uh, sorry, yeah, I went through this. The next piece is what we support is uh, we support other visualization tools that don't natively reside within the EMR cluster. So we enable Tableau that would connect onto EMR cluster using Presto. And, and then the data scientist can, or analyst can build their visualization on it and then publish it to the Tableau server environment for consumption. Okay, going deeper uh, into how is an EMR cluster built at Vanguard. So we have, like I said, my team, engineers, uh, reusable artifacts for everybody to spin up their cluster. So my team builds cloud formation templates, Ansible playbooks, we maintain Lambda functions, uh, JSON parameters, et cetera, and we store it in a sandbox Bitbucket repository. And then we push this sandbox uh, Bitbucket repository into AWS, into S3. Uh, the highlight there is we, we just build it, test it, put it out there. That doesn't mean that everybody at Vanguard can start using it. The next step of it is we have all the IT teams replicate what we have done into their own Bitbucket repository and use their bamboo build processes to deploy their clusters in their accounts uh, on their timelines. Lessons learned. Uh, before we go into lessons learned, right, we had four major, uh, what I say, non-functional requirements. Uh, first one was authentication, right? All services within EMR or any other AWS services has to integrate with Active Directory or Radiant Logic uh, or was a fundamental requirement. Uh, from an authorization perspective, we have requirements where we do not allow anybody to manually provide authorizations through AWS console uh, or any other means. It has to be fully automated, scriptable, and deployable uh, asset. It cannot be user clicking through the screens and providing access. Uh, and it goes into using IAM as the identity management mechanism. And the last piece under authorization was we we, we have a model of least privileged access. What it means is anybody who needs access to data, you give them access to only data that they really need and not to everything out there, which puts a certain kind of restrictions on how you enable these services at AWS. Third pillar, uh, which is very important also, is auditing. We always want to know what access can be provided or provisioned, what access is provisioned, and what access that was provisioned is being used by anybody. Uh, so those three pillars within auditing are very important for Vanguard. To have a clear line of sight on 
who is the user accessing what data and running what queries or running what jobs against what data at all point in time. Last one, uh, I already mentioned it. Uh, we have, we are using our Vanguard management managed encryption keys. Encryption at rest is a mandatory requirement and encryption in flight for everything is mandatory requirement. So those four non-functional requirements are some of the reasons why we experience some challenges. And I convert challenges as lessons learned, typically. And I've organized it into three areas, uh, but there are other challenges we can talk offline. First one is high vent presto. Uh, in our two-year journey, we figured out when we enabled Presto in 2017, it would do anonymous binds into Active Directory, which is not allowed at Vanguard. So we worked very closely with AWS, and AWS provided a fix, and they committed it back to the open source community so that Presto does, no longer does anonymous binds to Active Directory. There were auditing gaps uh, based on the requirements that Vanguard had. And AWS uh, provided us a solution. And we partnered on that solution. And it's now available in 5.12 version of EMR for everybody to use. And last, uh, authorizations is a challenge. Uh, Vanguard has strict requirements. Like I said, only give access to data that you need to. So at times, we need column level access. and. That's very significantly challenging at Vanguard. But also for authorization, we have to automate everything. So we wrote our own custom uh, Lambda function and other mechanisms to automatically authorize Hive and Presto queries through uh, Hive SQL authorization. Next, uh, we enabled Jupyter Spark, uh, and we were one of the first few clients working with AWS on enabling it. Uh, what we have found is Levy, uh, which is a core component of Spark and Jupyter integration, uh, has no authentication and does not support SSL. So we had to put code around it to make sure all communication between a notebook and Levy is secured, uh, is what we had to do. By default, uh, version uh, 5.14 that we are using right now in production uh, does not integrate with a custom repo seamlessly. Uh, the seamless part of it is if you need a Python package distributed on all the nodes of the cluster, that capability is not available in 5.14. So we had to build our own custom mechanism to take packages and distribute it on all nodes of the cluster. I believe that is resolved in 519 or above, but that's something Abhishek or Abhishek can answer. Uh, next one, uh, Spark Hive integration. We have seen a steady increase in demand of having to write Spark jobs and reuse Hive Meta Store so that you don't have to worry about the structure of the data. That integration is not enabled at Vanguard because we have found gaps in that implementation where it bypasses SQL authorization, meaning a person using a Spark code could drop uh, metadata about that table from the Hive Meta Store. So we haven't enabled it. We are partnering with AWS to resolve that and move forward with it. Auditing uh, shows up on this area too. We had challenges in that space. Uh, EMR, we work with EMR team to enable EMR FS level auditing so that we can know at every point in time who the user is using Spark or Python to access data. And then we enabled uh, Linux container executors and AWS execution role or environment for Python as we found a issue where the user information was never being transmitted uh, onto the Levy side. So we had to enable certain capabilities. 
Next one is Hue and Uzi. Uh, we have challenges in that space. Uh, Hue doesn't support file browse capability for encrypted buckets. You cannot upload file and put it in. So we ended up uh, opening up console and allow uh, users to upload and download files through the AWS console. Hive uh, allows execution of Uzi actions as Yarn user, uh, which we did not like because it, get, it gives the user a lot more access than required, which we had to fix. Uh, Uzi, Uzi local actions uh, can also be bypassed, which we had to fix for. And then Uzi Hive Server 2 does not support what we call service IDs. We didn't want Uzi jobs uh, written by data scientists to have their own personal user IDs stored in it, so we want them to use service IDs. But Uzi didn't support it, so we had to uh, re-engineer Beeline and customize it to work for our requirements. Let's go to some metrics of, and reasons to change, right? Uh, current state in production, uh, we have 150 plus IT engineers, data engineers, scientists using EMR clusters today. We have 250 plus clusters that get spun up and brought down across different environments. We have around 100 plus data stores or data domains brought in to S3 data lake. And we have almost a petabyte of uh, data enabled in data lake. These are important metrics because these are some of the driving forces of uh, reason to change, right? Because of all this, we have seen increased demands for our analytics, faster enablement of compute has become a requirement. Operational resiliency, as more and more analytics gets done, is becoming important. And then, last but not least, right, most important is self-management of compute. Uh, we hear loud and clear from our clients, business and IT, saying they want to manage the clusters themselves, turn it on, turn it off, change the size of the cluster, et cetera without having to go through some deployment process that could delay their cluster availability. That brings us to 2018, 2019, where are we going uh, as a future state? Uh, as part of that effort, I'm gonna first share how are we tackling self-service or management of clusters. Uh, this set of slides are towards usage of service catalog as a mechanism to launch clusters going forward. First, what happens is each line of business team in service catalog using a controlled process builds something called a portfolio within which you can have your EMR clusters. Next is a CTO team provides a base set of templates and artifacts that get deployed all the way to production for every client, and that becomes the foundational configuration of an EMR cluster. After which, SI teams can come in and customize it. Example, they can change their LDAP connection string or Hive Metastore connection strings if required, they come in and customize the cluster a little bit. After the cl cluster is customized to work, business users directly go to service catalog and spin up the cluster. As part of their spin up process, they can provide parameters like instance types, number of nodes they want, uh, whether they want to use spot instance or not, et cetera. So they can customize certain attributes of their EMR cluster going forward, which gives them that self-management capability to spin up the cluster when they want, shut it down when they want, move to a newer version when they want, or keep using the older version. 
Uh, benefits of this is now we have a very simplified and faster deployment process. Uh, it also gives increased operational resiliency because nobody is copying templates and making clones of what my team provides. They are reusing what we deploy out there. Provides flexibility to business to manage clusters on their own. And it becomes very easier to integrate this entire process into standard ITIL products and processes. Where are we going in future? Uh, main focus uh, going forward in future is operational resiliency and also how to get from one region to multiple regions and have full high availability all the time. First tower uh, that is around, it is all around EMR cluster and how do we take service catalog and put a front end to it uh, Vanguard's looking at using ServiceNow as a front end, and we will be using AWS Service Catalog Connector to launch assets or products in, in AWS. Next one, uh, S3, how do we make it more resilient? We want to start working on enabling versioning, which we haven't done yet, and which is a prerequisite for replicating it across regions. Uh, so that's where we are adding resiliency there. And then uh, adding resiliency for the IT teams to use Glue, Glue catalog for building their workflows, data ingestion processes, uh, providing them an additional tool set in their toolbox. Outside of this, we are expanding into other services like Athena, we are in process of enabling SageMaker uh, in production in 2018, early 2019. Thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. We have to roughly 12 and a half minutes. We can take as many questions. You're welcome. Right, let's start from here. Okay, who, who, who's the question for? Uh, it's uh, for one Okay, so the question is, Ritesh, do you have a pre-production environment for your developers? Yes, we, we have three environments uh, in Vanguard. We call it as accounts. We have an engineering account where it's like a development account. Then we have a test account where they elevate their cluster, but it's all lot controlled where they cannot make changes to it outside of the CD process. And then we have the production account. So we have two other accounts for each cluster or each team. So the, so the question is, how do, you, how do test accounts share uh, production data? No, they don't, right? Vanguard has a stringent rule of not having any prod data in any lower account. So what we do is, when you do engineering, we connect to engineering databases and pull that data, test it. Then we have a separate set of on-premise on data stores that we call it as test databases. Test, test account, pull data from test, and test against it, and then all of that goes to prod. So I think it's the question is, is there a, uh, when you test on the, uh, on the dev environment, uh, is the data still in S3? Does it come from a part everything, of prod? Everything is in S3. It's a separate set of buckets localized to that account. So engineering, test, prod, everything has separate S3 buckets there. Yeah, so we have seen those kind of issues pop up where you elevate your logic or application with the cluster to production and it doesn't work as desired. 
Uh, we try to handle it uh, by a convention called, we call it a pre-prod time frame, where any cluster is running in, during that cycle, that data is not available to business, or we tell business saying that data may not be clean yet for analytics. So that's how we handle it at times. So the question was, how do you prevent regressions if you're not testing for the entire data set? Correct. Right. Uh, go here. Um, that question comes on very often. Vanguard intentionally chose not to use Apache Ranger. Reason because when we started our journey, it was available for Hive. Uh, it didn't have much availability from an authorization perspective for Spark. And Presto wasn't available either. Plus, we didn't want to limit ourselves for future, meaning when we enable Athena, what do we do, right? It doesn't use Ranger. Or when we use Redshift, it doesn't use Ranger. So we intentionally decided not to use Ranger. And if required, brute force, separate PII from non-PII if required, and authorize people only for right data that they need to author get access to. So uh, also, um, Ranger, or at least from, uh, from my knowledge of Ranger, still doesn't enforce policies on S3. Uh, S3 enforces policies on the data in S3. So if you have Ranger, the Ranger agent actually works on enforcing policies on HDFS, and that works fundamentally fine. Um, if you've seen the announcement that came out today around AWS uh, lake formation, uh, one of the things that is going to do is enforce policies uh, on data that is sitting in S3 across EMR, uh, Athena, Redshift, and Glue. Sorry, here. The scheduling of the EMR jobs. So actually, we uh, all our EMR jobs are actually scheduled through data pipeline. So we have, what we have built is we have built a framework or a you know like a you know a DSL on top of the data pipeline, and that is what is used for scheduling. So we have done uh, very interesting ways to say when some jobs can be done in parallel, some cannot be done in parallel, and all that. So we have done that uh, through the data pipeline. Uh, question there. For me? Yeah. yeah, all data in S3 is encrypted uh, using uh, KMS uh, customer managed keys uh, everywhere, including in, if we use RDS as an example, Postgres, that data is also encrypted. Yeah, we also do the same, actually. We also encrypt the data. Yeah. And a bunch of these tools like EMR and Athena um, and Glue, they all allow you to use the encrypted keys from the same KMS right. store. Uh, there was a question there, right at the back, please. Yeah. So we actually. So so the question is, do we have uh, standalone? Uh, you know, do we spin up, spin down, or do we have like standalone clusters and all? So in our use case, as users create, as our customers create segments, uh, it's a very on-demand workflow. So we use we basically spin up and spin down our EMR clusters all across. So today, if you go and create few segments, immediately after that, a cluster will be spun up based on that. So think of it as that will basically uh, trigger a cluster creation, it will spin up, it will look at the data, it will look at the rules, it will process it, and it will bring it down. And you're not making any SDFS because it's already written to S3. Yep. That's right, yep. that's right, yep. that's right, that's right. For Vanguard, we, we do it at a bucket level. So, uh, No, we don't actually. We, we do it at the bucket level. Actually, S3 doesn't recognize that there is a field because the, uh, the entity in S3 is essentially a bucket and an object. So it can only encrypt buckets and objects, right? So it doesn't understand concepts of, S3 by itself doesn't understand concepts of tables or concepts of rows or columns or records, right? It understands buckets and objects. Um, yeah, so they. Uh,
Sure, true. Uh, when you do encrypt uh, uh, objects, the entire object is encrypted. I think what you're referring to is, can I selectively encrypt a certain field? Yeah, OK. Uh, any more questions? Well, thank you for your time. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for thank your participation. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.